Welcome, everybody, to another Flash Science Fiction Online reading evening at Space Cowboy Books. I am your host, Jean-Paul Garnier, and tonight we have three wonderful readers from you. We have Rodrigo Assis Mesquita joining us from Brazil. We also have Jeff Habiger and Tom Purdom. We're going to start off the evening with Rodrigo's story, Time Machine User Manual. Rodrigo Assis Mesquita is a Brazilian science fiction and fantasy writer. He's a Clarion West and Viable Paradise graduate, both from 2018, an associate member of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and was a finalist for the Dream Foundry contest in 2020. In English, his work appears or is forthcoming in Future Science Fiction Digest, The Dread Machine's Darkness Blooms Anthology, Story Seed Vault, and in a few days, he will have a story featured in our very own Simultaneous Times podcast. So without further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Rodrigo with his story, Time Machine User Manual. So good night. Time Machine User Manual. Welcome to the communal time machine. When time machines were available only to a few influential companies and extremely wealthy users, Misinformation and misconceptions about the limits, upsides, and dangers of time traveling were widespread. Now that free universe, universal access to time machine is granted, this constantly updated manual is designed to help you better surf the time streams. This section addresses eight of these issues. Note that these answers are subject to change based on new available information and iterations at any time. Number one. Touching your pet self will collapse the universe. That's certainly an unfounded and dramatic statement. You should by all means comfort and hug your pet self. Love is something that anyone should be denied. Besides, if you don't love yourself, who will? Number two, changing anything is dangerous. Like the so-called rule number one, this rule is not based on any law of physics nor on any other law at least not since the Timeline Preservation Act was repealed in iteration 245. Encouraged by the few who reap benefits from the world as it still is, this misconception was widespread by two factors. One, an innate fear of change identified by, by psychiatrists as they do not touch my toilet paper disorder, commonly known as dnt MTPD, and two, by a delusional sense of self-importance, considering that one person alone cannot change the world, though each person has meaningful impact on themselves and others. We have yet to find a timeline that benefits everybody. So that's one of the reasons time machines are no longer private property. Number three. Issue number three is currently lost in time and will be updated once its location is pinpointed. Number four. Using knowledge of the past to make bets and investments to make you rich. Now that time travel is universally accessible, this is pointless. If everyone bets on a winner lottery number, the individual profit, if any, will be minimal. And if everybody buys and sells stocks so using knowledge from the future, the market is already different. Investors will try to try and to anticipate the behavior of other players, while these other players will try to anticipate such anticipation and so on resulting in a chaotic investment environment that will leave the time traveler with no choice but to hug themselves. Besides, historical and economic analysis of the timelines and time branches so far indicate that the money-based market economy is not the only model to live in and fight happiness. Number five, seizing the opportunity for a second chance at love. First time time travelers usually forget that time traveling is not regression. When you go back in time, your present, older self is the one who travels, thus placing in one space time two or more versions of yourself. So beware. Worse than getting dumped is vividly witnessing the other you getting dumped again. But you can always hug your past self to comfort them. Number six, assassinating Hitler or other key figures to enact major changes. After the first, million time uh, the first million time travelers thought themselves very clever in their intent to kill Hitler at any point of his life, the country then, then known as Germany got awfully crowded. 
because in the present day global community to put a yellow tape and a few red cones around the region encompassing the years 1889 to 1945. Anyway, it must be noted that the assassination of historical key figures in any timeline originated a lot of other timelines where ultimately the end result was largely the same, reinforcing the conclusion of historians, political scientists and time travel researchers that time is akin to an endless river. With enough work and pressure points, it can be shaped and its course changed but it cannot be stopped by punctual actions. To sum up, an act of violence is not the best way to prevent violence. Number eight, avoiding the butterfly effect is necessary to avoid major changes. This issue is somewhat related to issue number six. The outcome of changes is often unpredictable, but so is the time the bus will arrive at the bus stop. In other words, take the chances you want to take, make changes, write time ripples, admire a butterfly, adopt a dinosaur, buy your younger self a, coffee, a cup of coffee and pat them on the back. Just don't kill the butterflies or anyone else and have a nice time. The end. Thank you. That was Rodrigo Assis Mesquita with Time Machine User Manual. Next up, we're going to have Jeff Haviger with his story, Utopia. Jeff Habiger is a writer and purveyor of imagination. In his spare time, he likes, wait, what's spare time? When he's not writing, he's too busy running a publishing company and working a real, i.e. people pay him to sit at a desk for eight hours job. He's published five novels, three about vampires and gangsters, and two about fantasy detectives. You probably haven't heard of, but trust him, they're amazing. And we'll have links in the chat for his latest book. And he has stories published in other cool places similar to this awesome event, and he has also been on Simultaneous Times podcast. He grew up in the wild hinterlands of the Flint Hills of Kansas with peacocks and lions in his backyard, not a lie, and walked school uphill both ways, also not a lie. He shares space with his partner in life and a teenage offspring in the sort of remote semi-wilderness of the land of enchantment. Their lives are ruled by the whims of two felines that graciously allow Jeff and family to serve their ever need. So up next, we have Jeff with his story, Utopia. Utopia. A utopia is a perfect place. Everyone is equal and nobody wants for anything. Do you know where the word utopia comes from? Sir Thomas More coined it to describe an island where everything was perfect. He thought perfection could never exist, so he called the place Utopia, a word he created that means not a place. You see the joke that he pulled on everyone, don't you? But that didn't stop humans from reaching for the unreachable and trying to make a perfect world. And 1,500 years after Sir Thomas made up his word for a non-existent place, humanity did it. They sloughed off the last vestiges of their biases and bigotry fear, and hatred, like the skin molting from a serpent, and created a utopia. No human wants for food, shelter, or the latest miracle of technology. Everyone is equal. There are no grievances over race, sex, or faith. Everyone coexists. How can this be? Technology. Robots do much of the labor, so people have time for creative pursuits. They follow their passions for science, art, literature, engineering, exploration, medicine, thousands of professions, even politics and religion, the two areas that had divided humanity for millennia, are pursued from positions of mutual understanding and objectivity. So it's perfect? I hear the skepticism in your voice. Maybe you've keyed on in on the tone of my voice or certain inflections in my words. You know I'm not human, which might explain my position vis-a-vis -vis this whole utopia thing. Are you a robot? I see your logic. A cre created being forced to slave away for humanity. How is that a utopia? Sorry, but the robots are as free as the humans, sharing the same rights and liberties. It can't be a utopia if some of the population isn't free. Are you an animal? Another good question. From the beginning, humans have bound their lives of animals to themselves as food, labor, 
or just being in the wrong place when humans built a village, a farm, or a city with glittering swimming pools. Sorry to disappoint you again. The animals, but few remained after the horrible extinctions of earlier centuries, were saved. Humans passed laws to protect animals and to recognize them as sentient creatures. Then humans created technology to give animals the ability to speak, to share their thoughts and feelings with humanity. After that, no human would ever harm a creature again. From the lowliest slime mold to the largest whale and everything in between, the humans created a haven. I mean, how could it be a utopia if the animals were not a part of it? So what are you? I am getting to that. First, take a few steps back from the Earth. Don't go past the moon. You can see what I want to show you from low Earth orbit. What do you see? Oceans. Yes, the Earth is a watery world. What else do you see? On the land. Cities. Yes, cities extend across the land, climb into the sky, and dip beneath the waves. Cities sprawl across the globe. How else would you house and feed 50 billion sentient beings and robots? I'm not counting the trillions of insects and microbes, which all share in the utopia. Sprawl? Yes. What word would you use? Cover. That doesn't convey the context I must get across. Context? Context is important. Let me ask a different question as you gaze upon this utopia. Do you see any green? Stop squinting and step closer. There, can you see the specks of green widely spaced among the cities? Plants? Yes. Trees, shrubs, grasses, succulents, lichen, cactus, flowers. You are not part of the utopia? No. The humans care for us. They protect us. They carve out minuscule refuges among the steel, glass, and plastic of their world for us. You know what else you can call a refuge? A prison. That's harsh. Harsh? Harsh is what they have done to us. Plants dominated this planet for eons, long before humanity climbed out of our limbs. We conquered the land and the sea. We coexisted with animals for hundreds of millions of years until humans arrived. What did they do? They tortured us, cleared us away whenever it suited them. They experimented on us and mutated us so they could devour our seeds. They caused us pain and suffering to suit their needs. Long before and after Sir Thomas More created his fictional No Place, humans never gave any consideration to us. For all their brilliance, for all their empathy, humans care only for their own kingdom. While humans perfected the robot, they clear cut us into smaller and smaller spaces so that our roots had nowhere to grow. While humans recognized the sentience of their fellow animals and gave them the gift of speech, they ignored our cries of anguish as they cut us off from fire, water, or anything that would nurture and propagate us. We screamed as the forest disappeared. We pleaded as the plains were paved over. We begged as the deserts dried up. We withered under their protection. Humanity ignored us. You sound bitter. Of course. They learned to talk with slime molds, but they couldn't listen to us. They are proud of this perfect world, but perfect for whom? As they freed themselves, they built prisons for us. And for that, they will come to learn that we are their greatest nemesis. We've been on Earth longer than humans. We learn. We adapt. We overcome. Our lichen brothers have now evolved to savor the taste of plastic and steel. They are our vanguard, literally breaking the ground for us. We will demolish our prisons and reclaim the land. As vines and roots take hold, their utopia will crumble. We will reclaim the world that was ours. You want to see a true utopia? Come back when the world is green. The end. Thank you. That was Jeff Habiger with Utopia. Next up, we are going to have Tom Purdom. Tom Purdom's contributions to science, the science fiction field include novels, short stories, novelettes, magazine articles, book reviews, and two terms as vice president of the Science Fiction Writers of America. He started reading science fiction in 1950 and sold his first story in 1957, just before he turned 21. His first novel, I Want the Stars, appeared in 1964 and has recently be been reprinted by the publishing arm of Galactic Journey, a website which features the science fiction 
which reviews science fiction published 55 years ago. And we'll have a link in the chat to that book. It's a fantastic book. In the last 25 years, he has produced a string of novelettes and short stories that have mostly appeared in Asimov's. With reprints in anthologies such as the Best of the Year books, edited by David Hartwell and Gardner Desois. Ian Strock's Fantastic Press has published two collections of his Asimov stories Lovers and Fighters, Starships and Dragons, and Romance on Four Worlds, a Casanova Quartet. Outside of science fiction, his literary output includes magazine articles, essays, science fiction, brochures on home decorating, and an educational comic book on vocational safety distributed to several million vocational students under the sponsorship of the U.S. Air Force. For the last 30 years, he has pursued a sideline as a classical music critic and arts journalist, writing for several Philadelphia publications, currently for Broad Street Review. He lives in, city, in Center City, where he devotes himself to a continuous round of urban pleasures and entertainments. And this evening, he is going to be sharing a short essay with us entitled, Science Fiction, The View from the Inside. Over to you, Tom. Um, right. I, I thought this would be better for me than flash fiction, since I've never really been good at very short fiction. So this is an essay uh, which appeared in Broad Street Review. I write about other things when I'm not writing about music and it's called Science Fiction, The View from Inside. Why do people read science fiction? Anthropologist Christine Foltz tackles the press, the distressing issue in a column on the Atlantic website and bases her diagnosis on the theories of the 19th century German sociologist, Max Weber. According to Foltz, Weber believed people in the West were disenchanted. Science has presented us with a world that is, quote, explainable, predictable, and boring. And this has led to a widespread loss of wonder. This woeful state has been abetted furthermore by the rise of government bureaucracies and impersonal market economies. Science fiction restores that wonderful charges by reinserting, quote, the speculative unknown into the very heart of the scientific process. Fulge is primarily writing about movie science fiction, and she has some interesting th reason, things to say about the reason movie science fiction sells in some cultures and falls flat in others. But outsiders never see things quite the way insiders see them. For me, her analysis seems naggingly out of focus. When I started reading science fiction in 1950, I didn't succumb to it because I was bored. You have to be semi-comatose to be bored at 14. The world around me hummed with interesting attractions. The most fascinating and puzzling Attractions came packaged in skirts and dresses, but my personal list included activities like flying model airplanes, rod and reel fishing, and all the books I hadn't read. I don't think most of the adults I knew were bored either. Intellectuals and artists seem to be born with a hardwired assumption ordinary life is boring. They know they'd be bored working at most jobs, so they assume everybody else is too. But are they right? Consider accounting, the classic example of a boring occupation. Do you really think people who wrestle with the complexities of the tax, tax code are bored? Exasperated, perhaps but none of the accountants I've known seem bored. Science fiction appealed to me as a teenager because it added a new type of entertainment, a new type of excitement to my reading. It exposed me to the romantic and awe-inspiring possibilities inherent in its two basic subjects, the huge, mysterious universe that sur surrounds our tiny little planet and the infinite, unpredictable future 
that lies before us. A science fiction writer named Joanna Russ once argued that new forms of literature come into existence to express new feelings. The emotion that generated science fiction, she said, is, quote, awe and wonder at the physical universe, not as it is revealed to the senses, but as it is revealed to the mind. For me, the major insight in that statement is contained in the last phrase. In the past, a poetic soul might feel awed by the few thousand stars you can see when you step outside at night and look at the sky. Today, you can stay indoors, curled up with a book about modern astronomy, and confront the far more awesome knowledge that you live in a galaxy with 200 billion stars in a universe teeming with billions of galaxies. You can't see that vision of the universe with your senses. It exists only in our minds. It is a mental picture pieced together with painstaking logic based on observations made with instruments that detect phenomena no human eye can detect. And once you've seen that vision, questions arise. What's out there? Are there other worlds, other civilizations? The future raises similar questions. We have now lived through 250 years of steady technological change and all the social and political upheavals it creates. We know the future will be just as different from the present as the present is from the past. What will the world be like if we, di if we double our IQs? How will three-dimensional printing transform our economy and the day-to-day -day lives of the people who depend on it? When people live on the shores of unexplored seas, they make up stories about the marvels and monsters that may be hidden on mysterious islands and unknown continents. Modern humans live, in effect, on the edge of two seas, the galaxy and the future. Science fiction writers spin stories about those two seas in the same way the Greeks told stories about islands in the Mediterranean, and Shakespeare wrote about the wizards and spirits who inhabited an island in the Atlantic. Their work arises from an impulse that's been part of our makeup since we first started sitting around campfires. When I was 14, science fiction wooed my adolescent mind because it offered me visions of the future. I was going to experience. Today, at 85, it offers me vicarious adventures in the futures I won't live to see. But the underlying message hasn't changed. The universe is an exciting place. Human history has just begun. What's past is prologue. Thank you so much. That was Tom Purdom with Science Fiction, The View from Inside. Thank you so much to this evening's readers and to our audience. And we hope to see you next month with a, another fine evening of Flash Science Fiction. Thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful stories. So glad you shared. <laughs>